Ukraine is a mess. Don't blame Donald Trump for that. Well, you know, one minute. Ja, wir brauchen die NATO. Wir sind überall, von Lithuania bis zum Sahel, von Afghanistan bis Irak bis Libanon. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Welcome to War and Peace. I'm normally your co-host, Hugh Pope, but today the tables are turned and I'm talking to Olga Olika, who is normally our host. She is director of our Europe and Central Asia program, after all, and the program has a new report out about Ukraine, Russia and Europe. Welcome to you as our guest, Olya. Thank you. So, yes, we have a new series coming out called Peace in Ukraine. It looks at what it will take to end the war in Ukraine. The first report in the series, A European War, is the one that has just come out. It looks at the geostrategic, the geopolitical underpinnings of the conflict, the stakeholders, the warring parties, why they're at war, how they see the war, how they see the prospects for peace. Future entries in the series will look at other aspects from ceasefires to elections to amnesties. And we're really looking forward to continuing this conversation, including here on the podcast. But before we get into the uh, geopolitics of it all, can you tell us a little bit about the situation on the ground. Ukraine, I think, has probably slipped away from most people's consciousness in the these days of the COVID-19 epidemic. Which has also hit Ukraine, of course. So I think most of our listeners know that the war in Ukraine began in 2014. But just as a reminder, uh, at the end of 2013, when Ukraine's then president, Viktor Yanukovych, took steps to reverse plans for his country to sign an association agreement with the European Union, protests began in Kiev, in the capital city. And in the months that followed, they grew into a popular uprising, which in the end uh, led to Yanukovych's departure in uh, late February of 2014. That surprised a lot of people. Uh, events moved really very fast, and nobody was quite clear on what was going on. But despite the fact that it was uh, very surprising to Brussels, to Washington, to Moscow, the Kremlin saw what had happened as uh, very much a Western effort to wrench Ukraine from its sphere of influence. And by the end of March, Russia had annexed Ukraine's Crimean Peninsula and soon was supporting a violent separatist movement in Ukraine's eastern Donbass region, beginning that war that continues to this day. Some 2 million people have been displaced. Some 13,000 military and civilian people have been killed. This has really been a devastating conflict. Today, it's not as hot as it once was, but it continues. People are still dying, again, military and civilian. Communities that have been torn apart remain torn apart. There is a line running through Ukraine that now, with the COVID-19 crisis, really can't be crossed, and families and livelihoods um, are often on the other side, divided by it. Although the parties signed on to agreements, the Minsk agreements negotiated in 2015 and 2016 with the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, these have not been fulfilled and indeed cannot be fulfilled in a literal sense as they incorporate deadlines that passed five years ago. Ceasefires have not held, as is evident from the continuing deaths. I can see that it must be very awful for the people who live there. And of course, the two million people who've lost their homes, the tens of thousands who've lost their lives. But from just listening to you, it sounds, as you say, it's on, on the low flame. Why should uh, anyone outside Ukraine care about this conflict? So the war in Ukraine is a war in the center of Europe, geographically and geostrategically. And this is actually a lot of what this new report is about. The reasons that Russia chose military action in Ukraine have to do both with its complicated history with this neighbor and with Russia's view of the rest of the continent. As I mentioned, uh, Moscow saw the overthrow of Yanukovych as an attack on itself by the West, not an internal Ukrainian matter. It sees the war in Ukraine as a battleground in a larger conflict between Russia and a U.S.-led West. And while this certainly isn't the way any Western countries uh, saw this back in 2014, in part because they have supported Ukraine, which was, after all, attacked, the territory of which was, after all, annexed, uh, which, after all, now has a neighbor that's you know helping to ensure a war continues on its soil, the Western support gave an element of truth to that Russian narrative. Russia was fighting, is fighting the West in Ukraine. Moreover, the fact that Russia did take military action in Ukraine made many other European nations nervous for fear that what happened in Ukraine, or some variation on it, could happen elsewhere, 
But once Western states see Russia as a threat, you also lend credence, once again, to this narrative of a Russian standoff with the West. And there is no easy way out of that. This is a primary dilemma of European security today. Russia as a threat to European security and stability, and Russia's view of the so-called West as a threat to its security and stability. But if it's so important to everybody, why has Europe not managed to do something more significant? Or why haven't the parties to the conflict worked harder to finish it up? So Europe has responded. Europe does not want to go to war with Russia. So Europe and the US have sought to impose costs on Russia for the annexation of Crimea and, separately, for the war in Donbass. This has involved cutting off contacts in various areas between the countries, limiting some sorts of cooperation, and sanctions, including travel restrictions and asset freezes targeting individuals linked to Russian operations in Ukraine or um, the ban on exports of weapons and dual-use items. Others have had more far-ranging effects and seem geared to harm Russia's economy as a whole. These include limits on access to primary and secondary capital markets, as well as to technologies and services linked to oil production and exploration. The intent, in theory at least, is to convince Russia to change its policy and end the war in Ukraine. Olya, you, you speak Russian, you travel to Moscow frequently and have done for many decades. What are the impact actually on ordinary Russians, on Russian policymakers who you speak to? So in terms of the effects of sanctions, initially the Russian economy did take a hit. Um, part of it was just the political effects, uh, you know, the ruble tanked. But it has proven remarkably resilient over the six years of the crisis, a product in part of luck, oil prices that mainly rose through 2016 to 2018, fiscal policies that kept inflation in check, that sort of thing. You know, Russian businesses cut salaries rather than fire workers during downturns, and that keeps people employed, right? It keeps unemployment from going through the roof, though some people did lose jobs. You know, it's interesting, there was a poll that was really shortly before the start of the COVID-19 crisis, and in it, a majority of the Russians uh, who responded said they did not personally feel the effects of sanctions, even though the country's economy had slowed. Of course, since then, we have had the COVID-19 crisis, which has had its own effects on the economy. But if anything, the effects that Russians really do ha have felt uh, from sanctions are from the sanctions that Moscow imposed on Europe in response to the European sanctions on Russia. And these greatly limit imports of European agricultural products. So, you know, you can't find French cheese and Norwegian salmon in shops in Russia if you're prone to luxury products, but there are a lot of other things you can't find even if you're not. And that's something that ordinary Russians notice. Though many of them blame the Europeans not Russia for this, although these are sanctions that Moscow imposed. So if this is the case, and I believe that one of the suggestions you're, you are making in this Ukraine line of work is that uh, Europe reach out a bit to, to Russia. Can you tell us what the uh, European official position has been a bit and uh, what has been its key uh, achievements from a European perspective? So we've talked about this on the podcast before, uh, when Sabine Fisher was on uh, some time ago, for example. So the EU position, right, and you do want to differentiate, there's the EU, there's NATO, there are individual countries. The EU position, five guiding principles for EU-Russian relations, which include full implementation of the Minsk agreements, closer ties with Russia's former Soviet neighbors, strengthening EU resilience to Russian threats, selective engagement with Russia on certain issues like counterterrorism, support for people to people contacts. But again, uh, what about the member states? What about NATO? NATO policy is one of assurance for NATO members that are most likely to see a threat from Russia and signaling to Russia that aggression won't stand. So that's been increased op tempo, exercises, some rotating deployments. And then member states have their own policies. Uh, France and Germany are, you know, part of the Normandy Four, which bring um, their leaders together with the presidents of Russia and Ukraine. Uh, in an effort to find a path to peace. France has also expressed the desire to find a way to improve relations with Russia, although this remains somewhat underdefined um, for the time being. All of this is, of course, part and parcel closely tied into the, the war in Ukraine and its reverberations. From a Russian perspective, it all continues to look like containment. From a European perspective, it's an effort to support Ukraine, cooperate where feasible with Russia, and try to find a way forward that will eventually be more secure. 
So in our report, we make the case for more security dialogue with Russia. That's precisely because the current situation is one in which everyone becomes more nervous with each effort to deter and reassure. Um, That's not easy. It's been tried before the war started. It's been tried since. European countries have sought to promote cooperation with Russia on climate change and counterterrorism, as I mentioned in the EU principles. Today, they might also try to look for ways to work together to respond to the pandemic. None of this has moved quickly or well so far. But, you know, if you say it hasn't worked before and therefore might as well not try, You're accepting the escalation dynamics. You're accepting this situation where you do have dangerous military activities or militaries operate close together. We've seen military incidents in the Baltic Sea, for instance, some of which seem intentionally provocative. You hope that at some point they maintain deterrence rather than continue to escalate and get you to to a war, which is the worst case scenario for everyone. So how do you do that? One way to move forward may be on more targeted, uh, narrower security issues, maybe sub-regional rather than continent-wide. Focus on the Baltic Sea. Focus maybe on the Black Sea, where Russia's claim on Crimea and buildup is making Black Sea countries, including Ukraine itself, very nervous. Um, Ask if there are ways to alleviate those fears and what Russia may want in exchange that could actually not hurt European security to deliver. With the collapse of the INF Treaty, there's fear of intermediate range weapons coming back to Europe. What can you really do about that? A lot of challenges there, uh, which I think we've also discussed on the podcast in the past. The CFE, the Conventional Forces in Europe Treaty, hasn't been around, hasn't been implemented in years. Is it possible to envision something that could take its place, even if you start from regional building blocks to get there? The U.S. plays a role, certainly, but this is about European security. And I would argue that in itself, European states' willingness to come to the table, acknowledging Russian concerns while also voicing their own, could send an important signal that Russia's views are heard, even if others disagree. Once discussions are underway, this may help temper antagonistic rhetoric on all sides. Yes, uh, one of the most fascinating parts of the report for an outsider like myself is to read about the actual dynamics of uh, the Russian perception of NATO and Europe's uh, actions. On the other hand, already the report has attracted some criticism that it's naive, that somehow crisis group is seeking to reward Russia by softening sanctions in the pursuit of an illusory goal of getting some Russian compromise in Ukraine. What do you say to those criticisms? So yes, sanctions. I think the most controversial argument put forth in this report is um, that we say that European countries and also the US, although the political situation in the U.S. makes this difficult, even more difficult than in Europe, where it's also quite difficult, but that they should consider changing sanctions policy. The current approach is all or nothing, and it's tied to the Minsk agreements, again, the one signed in 2015 and 2016. The deal being that all the Donbass-related sanctions will be lifted when the Minsk agreements are implemented. However, Russia feels that Minsk implementation is in Ukraine's hands, and therefore its narrative is that sanctions are part of the Western attack on it and will never be lifted. The history of sanctions, not these sanctions, but sanctions in general, is those that are meant to change behavior work better when they're somewhat flexible. We therefore urge an approach that would allow for lifting some sanctions in exchange for some progress, with a clear intent to reverse the rollback if progress is reversed. This does not, does not mean easing of sanctions before there is progress. It's got to be tit for tat and the progress has to come first. It also cannot mean wholesale easing or lifting of sanctions when there's just a little bit of progress. Most sanctions should in fact remain until there is a real peace, details of Minsk and whether, you know, agreements that were signed in 2015 and 2016 that have these deadlines that are linked to those dates, you know, that's another matter. I also want to make underline the point that the sanctions linked to Russia's annexation of Crimea should remain in place for as long as Russia continues to claim that peninsula. But it's worth asking if sanctions that look more like punishment sanctions that aren't as clearly tied to the specifics of the conflict like access to some capital markets, uh, some limited technologies and services in the oil sector, could be exchanged for Moscow's success in pressuring its proxies to provide access to monitors, to honor ceasefires, to cease passportization policies. Uh, They've been offering passports to Ukrainians living in Donbass fairly easily, which is uh, really a thorn in Ukraine's side. So 
By developing a plan to do this, Europe would be sending a credible signal to Moscow that sanctions can be eased without sending a message either of weakness or of desperation. Now, there are ver several very smart counters to this argument, and I think it's worth talking about them. First, any progress by Moscow could be reversed. Second, loosening the sanctions regime could jeopardize the European unity that's prevailed until now. So despite some disagreements early on, member states, which have to vote every six months to keep the sanctions on, they've done it each time. So there are not a few people who are afraid that any adjustment could weaken that unity and that if you reach agreement on easing sanctions now and then Russia does backtrack – You'd need consensus again from everybody, and you wouldn't be able to get it. So the risk is that by trying to make the regime more flexible, it will all fall apart. This is indeed a catch-22. We've got a policy that's not working, and it's a big pillar of the pushback on Russia. So you don't want to take it all away and signal complete collapse, but it's still not working. It freezes the situation. And by precluding any incentives for partial concessions from Moscow, it pretty much relies on Russia's continued intransigence. It works as long as it doesn't work, right? Not only is it not clear if the existing consensus will actually endure forever in this case, you know, because you are kind of counting on this continuing to be the status quo for a long time, but it raises this question of what happens if Moscow begins to make some concessions. Potentially, at least in part, maybe it'll do that in order to divide Europe, right? It gives Moscow this tool. So we were looking to find a way forward that actually creates incentives for meaningful compromise on Moscow's part and prepares Europe to act in unison in the event that happens. You know, that's, that struck us as a way of hedging against, well, progress. So again, I want to underline that what we're talking about is something very careful, very incremental, being very clear that the European Council will reimpose restrictive measures uh, within the framework of the common foreign and security policy if progress is reversed. I would also underline that none of this can happen without a lot of work across the European capitals. But I think it's important to at least talk about it. The current approach, again, it's not working. And Look, it's possible that after careful review, this way forward will be deemed unworkable, not possible. But I think it's important to consider it. And it's also very, very possible that there won't be any progress and the recommendation will be rendered moot. Again, because we're not saying ease sanctions and hope that the Russians then change policy. We're saying if the Russians change policy, ease sanctions. But I think it's really crucial to have the conversation because without it, we really do have no way forward. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. You're listening to War and Peace. Today, I'm interviewing Olya, our host normally, about Ukraine and the new crisis group report, Peace in Ukraine, a European War. So uh, coming back, Olya, to the uh, situation on the ground, you've been to Kiev recently. What do you make of the signs that actually, even before the recommendations of this report, they're actually gradual improvements already. We've seen prisoner release. We've seen statements, at least, uh, that Minsk will be reactivated, that the new president of Ukraine, who's been in power for a year now, is actually making some inroads in Moscow. Is it not better just to support the way things are going already? So Vladimir Zelensky came into office as president of Ukraine just about a year ago, and he had campaigned on a platform that promised peace. And he also promised real progress within a year and that if he didn't get it, fine, build a fence, give up. Uh, I recall talking to Ukrainians also at the time who said they'd give him a year to deliver, not just on peace, but on the other things he promised, like fighting corruption and uh, economic growth for Ukraine. He's had an interesting year. He was able to restart the peace process to some extent, uh, Normandy format meeting at the end of last year, prisoner exchanges, new ceasefire agreements. The thing is, where the Ukrainian public may still want peace, a lot of folks have been quite nervous about these changes and about his policies. Um, they fear that in order to get peace, he will capitulate to Moscow. And for a lot of Ukrainians, a peace in which Ukraine gives up sovereignty to Russia is not a peace they want. That's also, it's not a peace that Europe should want. It certainly would create a dangerous precedent for the effects of war and uh, very much a seal of approval on a might makes right argument. 
So from that perspective, keeping the war going has a certain appeal, though that too is awful for both Ukrainian and European security. So Zelensky is not helped by the fact that there have been a number of changes in his administration with senior staff getting swapped out. And he's not helped by the fact that um, these are important steps forward, but none of them have brought peace. You get the ceasefires, but they don't last. Although I would say that the one that uh, Zelensky was able to negotiate last year lasted longer and stood firmer than any of its predecessors. You need people to stop shooting. You need all the forces to leave. You need Ukraine to regain control of all of the Donbass. For that, you need Russia to stop backing the people it helped put in power in those self-proclaimed people's republics within Donbass and to, well, withdraw its weapons. The problem is that insofar as some of Russia's motivations for continuing this war are broader than Ukraine and have to do with European security as a whole, as we've been discussing, it's not going to do that until and unless there's some progress on that front uh, as well. It's interdependent. At meetings I've had at conferences with Russians, Europeans, Americans, Ukrainians, all at the table, we often have this conversation about Ukraine and a conversation about European security. And the Ukraine discussion ends by saying you can't resolve Ukraine without resolving European security. And the European security discussion concludes that you can't move forward on European security without resolving Ukraine. The truth is that these have to go forward together. The picture you've painted, though, of President Zelensky's position is not that strong. Is this really a moment where he can seize a crisis group set of recommendations and, and move forward and seize the opportunity for peace? I mean, is this a realistic proposition? Our recommendations aren't really to Zelensky. They are to his Western partners, particularly in Europe. And they're meant to be read in Russia as well. Our goal is to clearly lay out the positions that have put everyone in this very difficult situation uh, so as to make it possible to debate the options on the table and to move forward. Russia has for decades insisted that it is being constrained, contained, weakened by the so-called West. Since the Ukraine war, European countries and the US and Canada see Russia as an aggressive state that is bent on overthrowing a rules-based order. Ukraine is where all of this comes to a head, and you can't fix Ukraine without addressing the rest of the problem. There are two pretty extreme positions Western countries can take. One is to turn this into everything Russia thinks it is and actively do all they can to weaken Russia and prevent it from being able to act. Uh, but short of actually being willing to fight a war, which, again, I think most sane people would do a great deal to avoid because the escalation risks are so monumental, I don't think this is workable. Uh, so it just puts you on a slower path to that same escalation you're trying to avoid and still risks war. The other extreme is to back away from Ukraine, and that's everything the Ukrainians fear, a deal in which the Europeans trade Ukraine for their own peace and security. But that also creates a very dangerous dynamic in which force is rendered an effective policy tool in Europe and which, you know, that's how you make decisions. That's how you resolve problems. You do it by force rather than negotiations. That doesn't make Europe more secure. So they will have traded Ukrainian security and their own security away for nothing. So what we're urging is something in between uh, that ideally breaks out of that dichotomy. Talking about European security won't bring peace to Ukraine, but failure to talk about it will almost guarantee a continuing war there and continuing risks throughout the continent. So, which leads me to a last question. I mean, the Ukrainians are, to some extent, right to wonder what the great powers around them are going to do. And uh, you, you've made it clear that at least half the story is a grand bargain of some geopolitical type. You've been such a, an expert on Russia for so long. Can I ask you, how do you see the end, end state in 10, 20, 30 years' time? I mean, what is the natural resting point of Russia's relationship with Europe? So I want to very much emphasize that we are not advocating any sort of grand bargain, any sort of deal that is made by others over the heads of the Ukrainians. I'm not naive enough to think that all countries have all the choices in the world. Uh, alliances really only expand when they want to, uh, when all their members want to, when they think it's in their interests. Fear of others' military or economic might or response certainly limit what countries may do. This is how international relations work. I'm also not so naive, though, as to think that Russia and France and Germany and the UK and the US or whoever else you put at the table can sit down and make a deal 
that others will abide by, not just because they don't have the capacity to make such a deal, but because the disagreements and challenges that characterize European security today are so complex that they can't be decided in this way. For this reason, I also don't think there's any real natural equilibrium that you can aim for and try to reach. Right now, we're in a situation in which various parties perceive different threats from one another. Ukraine has a war in its territory, which Russia bears responsibility for. Russia sees a West that is bent on weakening it and limiting its power. EU and NATO countries see threats from Russian aggression in Ukraine and potentially elsewhere. This is a tinderbox of a situation. It is therefore imperative to calm it in the first place and then look for ways to limit dangers. And I think that is likely to happen somewhat piecemeal with arrangements and agreements on specific issues that maybe create more room to disagree on others without risking, well, armed conflict. I think it's critical, though, that the deals, whatever deals are made, be lasting. And for that, they need to be deals in which everyone walks away feeling both that they won something and that they lost something, so that they're willing to give up whatever it is that they've given up in order to keep whatever it is that they've won. Um, now, this is a recipe for a very difficult and complicated relationship for probably a long time to come perhaps until the global order really does change enough to make some or all of these disagreements moot. But it's a recipe that can perhaps stabilize the situation and perhaps, one really hopes, bring peace uh, to Ukraine. Well, let's hope for that. We're out of time now, but uh, doubtless the European-Russian relationship will go on fascinating people for a long time. But that was a great series of insights. Thank you so much, Olga. Olga Olika is our Europe and Central Asia Program Director here at International Crisis Group. And uh, aside from being grateful to her for talking about that, we'd like to say thanks to Miranda Sonnox, who coordinates our podcasts, and to our producer at Bull Media. War and Peace is obviously a crisis group podcast that is part of the Europod network. And we'll be back in a fortnight with Olga in her normal role as host. Thank you for tuning in, and thanks, Hugh, for your excellent questions. You can find our full report on our website, where you can also find many of our past reports on Ukraine, Russia, and the region. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group.